you made the awesome decision to do separate chemistry. So here's an awesome video to help you revise for it. I love flame tests. They are so, so pretty. You need to know that lithium will burn with a crimson flame, sodium will burn with a yellow flame, potassium will burn with a lilac flame, calcium with a red flame, barium with a green flame, even though it doesn't look green, and copper is going to burn with a blue-green flame. If you're going to use sodium hydroxide to test for your positive ions, we need to look at the ionic equations and we need to look at the precipitates. Testing for aluminium with sodium hydroxide is going to give you a white precipitate, which is then going to dissolve. Testing for calcium with sodium hydroxide is just going to give you a white precipitate, which will not dissolve. Testing for magnesium with sodium hydroxide will give you a white precipitate, so in this circumstance you would need another test to differentiate between calcium and magnesium. Copper ions will give you a light blue precipitate, iron 2 ions will give you a grey green precipitate, and iron 3 ions will give you an orange precipitate. For the ionic equations, we have our hydroxide ion and then our metal ions, and you are expected to know all of these. Then you just need to make sure your number of negative hydroxide ions is equal to the number of positive ions. So aluminium is three positive, so it needs three negative ions to become neutral overall. Calcium is two positive, so it needs two negative ions to become neutral overall. Magnesium, OH2. Calcium, OH2. Iron OH2, Iron 3 OH3. If you want to test something for a carbonate ion, you need to add hydrochloric acid, set up a delivery tube so any gas evolved will be collected down into lime water, and if it's carbon dioxide, the lime water will go cloudy. If you want to test a sample to see if it contains sulphite ions, you need to add hydrochloric acid, you need to add barium chloride, and if it contains sulphite ions, you will get a white precipitate formed. If you want to test for halide ions, you can add silver nitrate, and chloride ions will give a white precipitate. Bromide ions will give cream precipitate, and iodide ions will give a yellow precipitate. Yellow, but not as yellow as the walls of my lab used to be. Now this can sometimes be a very, very subtle difference and the best way to do it is by comparing it with the other things. In some cases, doing the test in class might not be as good as using an instrumental method. Instrumental methods can be faster, they can be more accurate and they are unbiased. Alkanes are hydrocarbons with single bonds only and the general formula for them is CnH2n plus 2. The first one with one carbon is methane, two carbons is ethane, three carbons is propane, and four carbons is butane. When we're drawing organic compounds, the important thing to remember is that hydrogen always makes one bond and one bond only, and carbon always makes four bonds and four bonds only. So you can see when I've drawn them, each of the hydrogens here only ever makes one bond, whereas the carbons each make one, two, three, four bonds. One, two, three, four bonds. One, two, three, four bonds. And because these are alkanes, they're only ever going to have single bonds. This line here represents a bond, and that is a pair of electrons. This is a covalent bond between these. You need to know the names and be able to recognise the um, pictures of these. And we can see the formula for these follows our general formula of CnH2n plus 2. So methane has one carbon and four hydrogens, ethane two carbons, six hydrogens, propane three carbons, eight hydrogens, and butane four carbons and ten hydrogens. Alkenes have a double bond and are unsaturated. The general formula for them is CnH2n. All of these are going to end in ene. So there is, with two carbons, ethene with three carbons, propene with four carbons, butene with five carbons, pentene. When we are drawing things in organic chemistry, we need to remember that hydrogen always makes one bond and carbon always makes four bonds. 
So ethene down here, hydrogen is making one bond and our carbon is making one, two, three, four bonds. This second carbon is making one, two, three, four bonds. A bond is a pair of electrons that are covalently shared. So a bond can be used by more than one carbon or hydrogen when we're counting things. You need to be careful looking at these ones, one, two, three, four. It would be very easy to make a mistake drawing some of the carbons in the middle here. You need to know how to name, recognise and draw the first four alkenes. The formulas for these for ethene, C2H4, propane, C3H6, butene, C4H8, pentene, C5H10. To make this slightly harder, the examiners might throw in some isomers. So this double bond for butene doesn't need to be here, it could be here. And these are named differently. Here the double bond is in carbon number 1, so that is bute 1-ene. Here the double bond is in carbon number 1, 2, so this is bute 2-ene. Here the double bond is in carbon number 1, so this is pent 1-ene. Whereas here the double bond is in carbon number 2, so this is pent 2-ene. You need to know how to test for alkenes. This is also the test for double bonds or unsaturation. You can see alkenes have two E's in there. It means they have double bonds. For this test, we use bromium water and it goes from orange to colourless. Colourless is really, really important here. Clear is not going to be enough to get you the marks. It has to be colourless. The complete combustion of a hydrocarbon involves lots of oxygen. That is your roaring blue flame on a Bunsen burner. This is going to be hydrocarbon plus oxygen turns into water and carbon dioxide. Incomplete combustion is where there's not enough oxygen. This is going to be your orange flame on a Bunsen burner. This is much more problematic because as well as the water and carbon dioxide, we're going to get carbon monoxide which is highly toxic, um, your white blood cells prefer it to oxygen, so you will actually um, suffocate to death, generally in your sleep, um, and carbon, which is black soot, which gets everywhere. The word mono means one, and mer means bit, poly means lots, and mer means bit. So we can say that a monomer is one bit and a polymer is lots of bits that have all been put together. If we're going to have a monomer of ethene, that will just become polyethene. So just putting poly in front of the name there. And if we want to take the drawing and turn it into a polymer, we need to take this double bond and break it. So that bond goes outside. We have a single bond between our two carbons. That's the other half of the bond. Drawing in our hydrogens, square brackets, you need to make sure your bond extends outside the square brackets, and a little N after it, and then you need to have a big N in front of your monomer. If you want to have a polymer of propane, we're going to turn that into polypropane. We need to draw it in a slightly different way to the way you may be used to drawing it, with our double bond here, and our third carbon up here going round a corner. Exactly the same way, break one of the bonds, one bond left in the middle, other bond goes outside, and then all of the other groups around the hydrogen stay the same. Little n after it, big n in front of it. If they want to try and make this more complicated, they could change this CH3 group to a fluorine group or a bromine group. All you'd do then is exactly the same, just replace the fluorine group in the same place. When we polymerize something, and this is I'm going to show you is condensation polymerization, we add monomers together. In condensation polymerization, we're going to add these bits together here and we're going to lose a water molecule. For condensation polymerization, you can see we had two different functional groups here. The opposite ends of amino acids, which I've drawn here, and we have lost water as a small molecule. Condensation polymerization is when we lose a small molecule from the reaction and it is usually water but not always. Thermosetting and thermosoftening polymers have very, very different properties and this is based on their structures. 
Both have long polymer chains in, but the thermo setting have cross links, whereas thermo softening don't have cross links. This means upon heating, the thermo softening polymers can just slide past each other, whereas the thermo setting polymers cannot slide past each other. Which means thermo setting polymers are going to burn and thermo softening polymers are going to melt. Here is the structure of DNA that I have sitting on my desk and you can see that there are two lines going through it because DNA is a double helix structure. You can see each of the bases in here, all the different colours. The bases are A, T, C and G and they go together in that format. A always bonds with T, C always bonds with G. This is to do with the number of connections they can make. So you're always, always going to get A bonding with T and C bonding with G. It has a sugar phosphate backbone. And there are two of those, these, these that go up the side around the DNA. Two strands that can break apart down the middle when the DNA wants to replicate. A section of DNA, such as this, can be called a gene. And then genes hold the information for making amino acids and proteins, which is the building block of you and me. Sections of DNA can be read, so three um, bases of DNA can be read and turned into an amino acid. These amino acids can then build all together to make a gene. Alcohols have an OH functional group and they end in O. So one with one carbon is going to be methanol, with two carbons, ethanol, with three carbons, propanol, with four carbons, butanol. When we draw our alcohols, we need to put our OH groups on here. And we need to remember and make sure everything has the right number of bonds. Hydrogen is only ever going to make one bond, carbon makes four bonds, and oxygen makes two bonds. Organic chemistry is a very likely place for them to sneak nasty questions in, and this is one of the nasty questions they could sneak in. Propan 1 ol has carbon, has our alcohol group right on the end. Butan 1 ol has our alcohol group right on the ends. Propan 2 ol has it in the middle. Here is our alcohol group up here. And Butan 2 ol has it in the middle here. Learn these and recognise them. Alcohol can be used for drinking or as a solvent. When you react it with sodium, it's going to fizz. When you react with oxygen, it's going to burn. It's just a combustion reaction. And when you react it with water, it's going to dissolve. Another way of producing alcohol is fermentation. This is where we take sugar, we mix it with yeast, we keep it nice and warm, and we're going to get ethanol, which we can use for alcohol, or carbon dioxide, which makes the bubbles in bread. Exactly the same process, beer making and bread making. If you want to measure the energy released by burning alcohols, and you can always compare different types of alcohol with this, you need a known volume of alcohol. You can weigh this on the scales. Burn it, use it to heat a known volume of water and measure the temperature change. We can then work out the energy by using the mass times temperature change times the specific heat capacity of water. Carboxylic acids have this as a functional group. Something with one carbon is methanoic acid. Two carbons is ethanoic acid. Three carbons, propanoic acid. Four carbons, butanoic acid. Methanoic acid, one carbon making four bonds. Double bondage to oxygen and an alcohol group. Ethanoic acid, propanoic acid and butanoic acid. You need to be able to recognise and draw these. You use carboxylic acid much more than you recognise because ethanoic acid is vinegar. 
It is an acid, so if you're reacting with any carbonate, you're going to get your standard acid carbonate reaction, and it's going to fizz. And if you're reacting with alcohols, you're going to make an ester. If you react an alcohol with a carboxylic acid, you're going to get an ester. For example, if you react ethanol with ethanoic acid, you're going to get ethyl, ethanoate, and water. Nanotechnology is absolutely fascinating. It is taking atoms and rearranging them into um, specific um, locations or specific sizes um, so that we can use it. It is much, much smaller than technology. It is very small. But it is made up of lots of different atoms. Now the potentials for this are massive because as we get small we are increasing the surface area. And when we get this small, things have very, very different properties. Things look see-through, things are flexible, things start to behave very differently to they would um, if they were much, much larger. The potential for this is massive communications, um, drug delivery, personalised medicine. But people are wary about this because it is a new technology. The majority of glass we use is made up from silicon dioxide. Ceramics, such as clay ceramics, are a mixture of silicon dioxide and aluminium oxide.